So we have this new series this month of June, and we entitled it Service Charge. Everyone who is saved is called to serve. All believers of Christ are mandated, charged, and called to serve. Jesus said, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Our goal is to encourage every believer in Christ to actively participate in building up the body, the church, through serving in the ministry. So hopefully we can encourage everyone to join and serve the church. Because as Apostle Peter said, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So in this whole month, in this Five Sunday Conversation series, we will learn timeless principles from various New Testament characters who serve God with their lives. So let me start our conversation with this question. Who likes exams? No? So I remember that in, in, in my, my university days, one of my professors said, we don't have exam in this module. We're so happy that we realize, then how will he will grade us? So we come to him, please give us exam. <laughs> you like it, right? When the teacher said, let's have a quiz, then everyone will say, yes. Okay. In biology, what is the oldest fish? Century tuna, yes. In... Probably some people, will get, huh? what? what century to? I think your mom need to cook a canned food tonight if you don't know what century tuna is. Okay, in chemistry, so you know litmus stress in acid and basic, so okay. So what will happen when you drop your red hat into the blue sea? It will get wet. Yeah, that's right. Then problem solving. There are three men who jump into the water. How many got their hair wet? Not <laughs> three. Why? Why is none? <laughs> it's very clear, right? The question is how oh, many three? Now, I see. I think some of you will say none because all of them are bald. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that we, whenever we're still studying, especially in the Philippines, whenever we have a test or an exam, we always do it by ourselves. If you ask for help from your classmate, it's called cheating, right? So that's the mindset that we have learned, that whenever we face a problem, we do it alone. So I'm saying that there is no need to face the problem alone. So there are some people who have realized this, so they don't follow this mindset. And usually those people are doing good in business because they know that they cannot do anything by themselves. So they hire people. Right? And usually also those managers, we also know this, they will have people to accomplish a task. So that's kind of mindset that we can have. It's either you are a loner when you face a problem, or you have a, a team to help you when you're facing something. Right? Are you an individual-centric or a community-centric person or mindset? So during this conversation, we will discuss and talk about mindset and reward, and how mindset and reward relates to service. Let's define mindset before, before anything else. Okay, mindset is a mental state on how you interpret and respond to situations. So that's your mindset. It is actually an established set of attitudes. One of the mindset is this, I can't do this, I don't have the talent. But if you have the other one mindset, I may not be able to do this now, but with time and effort, I'll be able to do it. Then you have a different mindset. It means that you will be able to do something with the problem that you're facing. It reminds me of my boss. Actually, he's the owner of the company I was working before. Sometimes we, I argue with him. So that's why my, my, my manager will always say, why do you argue with him? So, but he's so nice to listen to. And then I always learn the mindset that he has. Because he always say, repeatedly, he always say this. But when, whenever we face a design problem, because I'm doing design, whenever we do a design problem, he always say, there's always a solution to any problem. 
So that's why whenever we face a problem, we always look for solution. That's why in, he has more than 200 inventions under his name. What is the mindset of Christ? Actually, Apostle Paul gave us a hint. What is his mindset? It is written in Philippians chapter 2. This is about kenosis. Okay, this is just a Greek term, which means self-emptying. And from these verses, you will learn about the mindset of Christ. Okay? So that, this is what Apostle Paul said. Who, though he, he here is Jesus, though Jesus was in the form of God, did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. So that is kenosis, self-emptying, by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of man. In the seminary, we always have this uh, debate or because people have different ideas about kenosis. They have different positions. So there are two positions that I would like to highlight. There's a lot. I just want to share two. First position is this, that Jesus Christ gave up his divine attributes. So basically, he ceased to become God. He changed from God to man. And there are some people who have this kind of belief, who claim that they are Christian. They believe that Jesus is Lord, but they don't believe that Jesus is God. So this is because of probably they, this is what they understand about this verse. Another position which I uh, in, subscribe to is that Jesus is both God and human. He is fully God and fully human. Why? Because of this verse. It's written here, taking the form of a servant. He used the word taking instead of changing. It means that he is God and he added another nature. That's why he is fully God and fully human. So where's the self-emptying? Because our understanding of empty is you lose something. Right? Agree? If you say empty, it's you lose something, right? You gave up something. So what did he give up? Jesus Christ gave up his will, the exercising of his will. So he totally depend on God. So when, he, when we talk about kenosis, it means his total dependence to God. Because he gave up to exercise his will. He gave up his will and totally let God done his will. That's why he always pray, may your will be done. And even in the Bible, he never do something on, on his own. It's the Holy Spirit who moved first. You read it in the Bible, in Matthew chapter 4, you will see that the Holy Spirit who moves first and he followed it. So that's why self-emptying or selflessness, because if you lose your will, you're selfless. Right? If you lose your will, you're selfless. That's self-emptying. That's kenosis. It means total dependence to God. Let your will be done in my life. So that is what happened. But still, the question is, why? Apostle will answer that. But the answer is the verse prior to that. And this is what he said. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Right? So this is the answer. Why Christ needs to self-empty? Because he is looking to the interest of us. He don't benefit in dying. Does he benefit anything when he died on the cross? No. He was looking after for us, for our benefit. So that's the, that's the meaning of this mindset of Christ. He totally depends on God. At the same time, he think of us. He give value to all, all of us. So that's why we learn from that. We interdepend to one another. So dependence and interdependence, that's the mindset of Christ. And that's why Apostle Paul said, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And the answer of that is those one I said in kenosis. Because the part after this verse is the kenosis verse to show us what's the mindset of Christ, which leads us to the point of this message with a Christ-like mindset serving is rewarding. So with this kind of mindset, the mindset that is depending to God and interdependence, that's the mindset of Christ. That's why I use this. As, I mean, 
we are actually using the symbol of the jar in our whole, whole series. And I, and I realized when I was looking about kenosis, they also use the same symbol because this is self-emptying. You're emptying the water, right? And this is also a symbol used for kenosis. You're emptying yourself. So this is total dependence of God. That's the mindset of Christ. At the same time, it is also bringing value to others. That's service. So that's why Christ is our model for selflessness and sacrificial service to the church. So if you look for any model, Christ is the model. Amen? We're going to do something different. We have this game in the Philippines. Usually it's not, it's, it's not really a game, but part of the game. We call it Maibataya. So this is how we play it. Players will pile up their hands, leave it, and show if your palms are facing up and down. So initially, you will pile it up, and then you say, Maiba Taya. And those player who flips his or her hand differently from the rest will be the it or the Taya. Okay? Someone have the same palm facing up or down, it means you have the same mind. You're thinking the same, right? It's not that you have face down and then you're thinking face up. Basically, you have the same mind, right? That's why the title of this sharing is like-minded, like the mind of Christ. So there is one New Testament character to have the same mind as Christ. Apostle Paul actually already said it in the first part of chapter 2 when he say, make my joy complete by being like-minded. This is what he said. That's why I, take, I, took, the, I took the title from from the verse, like-minded, to have the same mind. But be careful, I'm not saying that we are united and then we forget the truth. That's what the cult do. They are all united, but they already sway from the truth. I want, I'm trying to say that you have a right mind and the right thinking and the right truth. We are united, but we are united with truth. It's not that you are united. Whatever the, the leader said, we just follow even though it's wrong. So that's a cult. When I'm trying to say like-minded, it's with the same mind as of Christ. And then this person is named Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus. So the, in Greek name, it means charming. In Latin, it means handsome. That's why when we're asked to, to, to choose, I choose this one. Because I can relate. So much. Sa name pa lang, malapit na eh, Rogelio, Epaphroditus. Very near. Right? Greek. Greek, Greek name means charming. Anyway, he's a member of a Philippian church, definitely. He knows, I mean, he, he probably is devoted because he was given a chance to give and send the gift to Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul said that he has close relationship with him because he vouched on him. And he is also a messenger and a minister. Remember these two words, and later we discuss about it. And he showed selflessness and sacrificial service like Christ. That's why they have the same mindset as of Christ. Selfless and with sacrificial service. So let me just give you some diagram of what happened to Epaphroditus. So the Philippian church sent Epaph. Let me just say Epaph. Ang okay. Epaph to Apostle Paul. Why? Because Apostle Paul was in prison. And at that time, if you are in prison, as Jezreel has mentioned before, if you are in prison, no one will take care of your needs. And only your relatives, your friends, who will bring their food or something so that you can take care of, of your needs. In this case, the Philippian church is sending a path to Apostle Paul. And they are also expecting that he will finish the task. And what's the task? that he will keep providing and helping Apostle Paul until he get out of the prison. But what happened? Apostle Paul sent him back to church. There should be something wrong, right? Can you imagine your parents ask you to buy something and you come back? What's, the, what's your parents' reaction? What's wrong? There's something wrong. It reminds me of my, my last time when my father asked me to buy something in the convenience store. I come back again because there's dogs along the way. Same thing with uh, Epaphroditus. No? He was sent back again. There's something wrong about it. So that's why we'll discuss about it. 
what happened? Why if I, why Apostle Paul need to send it back so fast? And to answer that, we need to see first the whole picture, the outline of Philippians. First chapter is the greetings and praise of Apostle Paul and his affair because he was in prison. But he's giving a good news because he's saying that almost all people around him know about Christ. So that he is probably not so in a bad situation. And that in chapter 2, the first part, he talked about the mindset of Christ, which we, just now we have discussed. And then the later part, he gives an example of those people who have the same mindset, particularly Timothy and Epaphroditus. From 3 to 4, the middle part of 4, is some warnings and exhortations, and the last is thanksgiving. So what is the purpose of this letter now? Anyone? What do you think will be the purpose? If you see this outline, and what is the purpose of Paul? From this outline, you have imagine. oh, it might be a thanksgiving letter. Right? Because the Philippians sent some gift to him. So probably this is a thanksgiving letter. Or it might be a warning letter. Because they hope some problem, but actually it's not really so, so bad. I mean, he just gives some warning just to make sure that you will not do this. But Philippians are doing well. So the most possible, and I later will we'll discuss more, is this letter is actually a commend, commendation letter because he is commending Epaphroditus. Of course, Timothy is part of it, but we'll discuss more Epaphroditus. He is commending Epaphroditus. And this verse, is come, uh, you will find it in 25 to 30. So let's dig in about his commendation on the life of Epaphroditus. And this is what he said. I have thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier. So he used those terms, my brother, because this is what the term that we use with the body of believers, brothers and sisters. Fellow workers, because he worked with the gospel. That's what Apostle Paul is saying. I go and spread the good news. And fellow soldier. So this is unusual. Unusual, but Apostle Paul used this. But most likely because he can find a lot of guards around his area. That's why he used the word soldier. Most likely, so, because soldiers are what? I mean, in the NS, what do you, what do you learn from, from, from NS? It's not only for guns, but being, having the same camaraderie, being, looking, at, looking at my back and I look at your back, so taking care of one another because we have the same danger that you're facing. So probably this is what Apostle Paul is trying to say, right? So that's why in the, he used the word a military, in a military term. Because in the military, you learn a lot of terms. Like, like in an Air Force, right? He say, no guts, no glory. Marine, no retreat, no surrender. Army, no pain, no gain. Security guard, no ID, no entry. Right? Especially in the school, right? You cannot go in without ID. So last time when I go in, ID mo. Sure. Ipin mo. Yeah, probably some of you was thinking, if you don't know what's Ipin. <laughs> Ipin, you mean you pin the, the ID. <laughs> but I show my teeth, right? I sh it means I need to pin the ID, not my teeth. I know that's a bit, some people are a bit slow, but later never realize <laughs> about the about the joke, but anyway. Again, it's not only these three that he, he mentioned. He mentioned another two words, very, very important words, as I mentioned just now. Messenger and minister. The Greek word for messenger is apostolos, which we use as apostle, as a word we use right now in English. And the other one is liturgos, which is liturgy. So both those two words is actually more of for Apostle Paul, rightfully a term for Apostle Paul. But Apostle Paul used these two terms to commend Epaphroditus. These two powerful words. Because when you say liturgos, when you say minister, you're probably a well-known, respected public servant in their time when they're called. So that's why he used those two terms. That's how he commend Epaphroditus. So what, still, we don't know yet 
the answer why he need to send back Epaphroditus, right? Then he continue. For he has been longing for you, for you all, and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. So it means he, was, he got sick. And that's why, because of that, probably they heard, the Philippian church heard, na nagkasakit si Epaphroditus, that he got sick. So, so that's why Epaphroditus is worried. Because probably they have his loved ones, his friends, because they never heard any resolution. Kung gumaling ba siya, nabuhay ba siya, right? So this is one of the reasons why. So Apostle Paul continued, he said, Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So it means that uh, Epaphroditus experienced a near-death encounter. He encountered a near-death experience. And they use here, God had mercy on him. It means that his experience is probably terminal. It means that probably they cannot do anything about it unless God intervened. So that's why he used the word, God had mercy on him. Talagang seryoso yung sakit ni Epaphroditus. But Epaphroditus, out of his faithfulness, he continued to, to journey until he reached Apostle Paul, even though he got sick along the way. So that is how faithful and how he served sacrificially. Okay. Then he said, I am more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again and that I may be less anxious. So now this is the three reasons why Ep Apostle Paul sent back Epaphroditus to the church. So first is because Epaphroditus was stressed, distressed. Second is the Philippians church is also distressed because they hear the news without the resolution. And then Apostle Paul himself is also anxious that that is happening to, to this. So that's why he sent back Epaphroditus. So now you have the reason, you now understand why he sent back Epaphroditus. And because he also understand that he need to finish the task. So when he come back to Philipp in Philippi or in the Philippine church, some people may badmouth him. Some people may get disappointed. Why? Because he didn't finish the task. The task is to take care of Apostle Paul until he get out of the prison. So that's, that's the problem. So that's, what, that's why he continued Apostle Paul here. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. So this is what he tried to say when, because imagine, Epaphroditus is the one who is bringing the letter and the one who is reading the letter to them. Right? So that's why Apostle, uh, Apostle Paul is saying, receive him with joy. Because we, they know that there's some people who might be disappointed. And honor such men. So here, Apostle Paul is instructing the Philippians to honor people who serve, especially those who serve sacrificially. That's why I'm taking this opportunity to thank and to honor those who serve in our church and those who are in our koinonia and even to those people who have been a part of my journey in, with the Lord, even past back in the Philippines. I honor the Lord because of your life, and the life of those who helped me back in the Philippines. So basically, I am so young, probably around 21 years old, and then I joined this, we call it prayer cell group. And, you should, and I am the youngest. So most of my koinonia mates are the, I mean, the lolas. So probably 65 and 70. Of course, there are some other young, but the lolas. And whenever they sing, they sing like they're already in heaven, right? So they always sing, my soul. That's, that's how, how they, they, they sing. And sometimes they, are, they, do, they don't care about others when they sing. So sometimes they will sing, soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon. So while they're singing that, I just realize, Lord, I still want to get married. <laughs> I still want to see my great grandkids they're ready to go <laughs> they're so ready to go soon and very soon we're going to see the king anyone here but it's, anyway it's, it's very encouraging 
That's why I, I encourage all the young people, not only to your same, same age, you join those communities, especially with the Lolos and Lolas. You will never realize how faithful is God until you hear their testimony. That's why I, even though I'm the youngest there, I am so glad that I am that group, hearing the faithfulness of God, hearing those stories upon stories that they don't have food and how God provides for them. That's wonderful. That's why I encourage you, especially those who, who are also um, uh, got married. So join those who are already married for a long time. We also learn from that. So that's why I'm here to honor those people who have been part and who serve sacrificially. That's what Apostle Paul said. Honor them because whenever you honor those people, those people who serve, you honor God. That's also written in the Kenosis. The last portion of that is, Therefore God exalted Christ that in every knee should bow, every tongue will confess and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. For what? For the glory of the Father. So the moment, the moment Christ was glorified, God is also glorified. Same with people who are serving. Anyone who is honored because of your service, God is also honored. But because that's part of the glory of God. And then Apostle Paul continues, For he, Epaphroditus, nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Risking his life. So this is what I said, that he, he knows that this work of Christ is, will cost probably his life, but he continues his sacrifice himself. He served sacrificially, selflessly. He served for the work of Christ. Because we know it is Christ who is working in our midst. Basically, in this, in this verse, when you say work of Christ, it's more on spreading the gospel. The reconciliatory work of Christ. The reconciliation. Because the reason why we are here is to, for others to know about Christ and to have a reconciliation with God. So this is what Apostle Paul means here when you say a work of Christ. Because at the end of the day, uh, Epaphroditus is actually helping Apostle Paul. And Apostle Paul doing the spread of the gospel. So the, his support is actually part of doing the gospel. So yun yung ibig sabihin na he died for the work of Christ. Lahat, lahat tayo, we have different part in doing this ministry. Amen? That's why, with a Christ-like mindset, serving is rewarding. I know that some of some of us will say, it is also practical, right? Because if you have a wrong mindset, serving is tiring. You can see this. A lot of people go to the office because their mindset is just to get my salary. Probably you're happy on the salary day. Then after the salary day, you're dragging again. Because if your mindset is only just to get the money, to get your salary, that's your, your my, wrong mindset. And serving is dragging. But if you have the right mindset, serving is rewarding. You see all the businesses who are customer-centric, they flourish. Most of the businesses who are customer-centric, who think about the customer, who think to serve in qual I mean, quality service, they are rewarded, they are successful. Example is SIA. That's how they do the, their business. They always make sure that their service is high is par excellence. That's why, because they know serving is rewarding if they have a right mindset. But for us in the church, it's not only the right mindset. We have a Christ-like mindset. Right? Because whenever you have a... I mean, if you serve, you feel good. Right? You feel good. If you serve, you probably hear the praise of the people. But this is not the reward that we are looking for. Even though you feel good, we don't look for the reward from men. We're looking for the reward coming from God. And what is that reward? Apostle Paul also said that. He said also in Philippians chapter 3, I am pressing toward the goal to win the heavenly prize. So he is also looking forward to that reward. And that to be in the presence of the living God. Amen? 
that's the reward that we, we have. So from here, you already know and understand that we have two rewards. I mean, two rewards I already have mentioned. One is you, whenever you serve, there's an honor. There's honor in serving. Second, of course, you feel good, but our reward is to be in the presence of God. But I think the ultimate reward is this. This is the ultimate reward. Jesus is our reward. Amen? The God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords who come down to earth to serve, not to be served. That is our reward to serve Christ. Can you imagine when you are serving the King of kings physically? Isn't it wonderful? That's why we're looking forward to the heaven to see and gaze the beauty of our God. Looking forward on the day that you will see face to face Christ and you are willing to serve Him. But you know what? You can serve Him while on earth. We can serve Him while on earth because this is what He said. He said, whatever you did for one of the least brothers and sisters of mine, it means brothers and sisters is part of the church, you did for me. So you don't need to wait for heaven, mga kapatid. We can serve Christ right now. Amen? We can serve Christ right now to the one who sits beside you because Christ is in that person. Because he said that what you did to your brothers and sisters sitting beside you, you did in Christ. That's the wonder and the wonderful work of Christ. That's the reward that we have. We're looking forward to see and feel the bringing value to, to our brothers and sisters because we serve in Christ. Amen? With Christ-like mindset, serving is rewarding. With this mindset of Christ, we know that serving is rewarding because Jesus is our reward. Looking forward to be in the presence of God and see the glory and the honor of God together with His people. Wonderful. Wonderful, isn't it? Serving is rewarding because of that. Serving is rewarding that you have the same mindset of God. And not only that, as I mentioned, that you serve one another, you will also see the wonder of God, wonder of Christ, His work, even right here in our midst. That's how we serve one another. We bear each other's burden. We bear each other's burden. You not be a burden to another, but you bear the, His burden, your brother's burden. That is what try, what's trying to say of this kind of koinonia. This is the mindset that Christ is trying to say us. We depend on God. We interdepend to others. It means our strength will be the strength of others. Your strength will be my strength. Because of my weaknesses, it will complement to the other people's strength. That's a Christ-like mindset and makes our serving rewarding because we are doing it in the presence of our God. Amen? Wonderful, right? Wonderful. So, since we have this mindset, I encourage everyone to serve because it is rewarding. And how are we going to do it? So, this is my challenge. Serve like Jesus. Have same mindset as Christ and serve Him. Because He served selflessly. He served sacrificially. And we who claim that we are a follower of Christ, we who consider ourselves a follower of Christ, naturally we follow and do and have His mindset. We serve like Jesus. Yeah.